We start the recording right now. So welcome to the third lecture of our series of Ethics of Artificial Intelligence. My name is Roberto Zicari, and uh, I'm the host for this session today. In the first two lecture we did, in the first one, an opening, a kind of a introduction to a number of topics that uh, will be covered in the uh, next lectures. The second lecture was from uh, Emmanuel Goffey that gave us a uh, quite nice uh, overview of principle of ethics. And I'm extremely happy to introduce our first speaker, uh, Professor Rafael Calvo from Imperial College of London. His presentation will cover another broad area that also is quite interesting for us from design to impact assessment. And without any further delay, uh, Rafael, the floor is on you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Roberto, for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here with you virtually, at least. Um, Yes, I joined Imperial College in July. I'm a design engineering and design engineering, uh, for those who might not be used to the term, brings together design thinking and engineering practice. Uh, before I start, I wanted to ask everybody to, oops, let me turn off this, uh, go in, on your mobile phones, please, uh, to menti.com. Uh, M E N T Y I dot com and use the code 113566. So I'm going to try to make this uh, session a little bit more interactive. Uh, and to do that, I'm going to be using uh, this tool that allows me to ask questions and hear back from the audience. Um, so when you go there again, M-E-N-T-I, and then use the code 113566. And then you get to vote on what are the different uh, disciplinary backgrounds. So we can see, everybody in the lecture can see where people are coming from. What is uh, uh, the potential background understanding uh, that we might have on this topic? Excellent. So we have, let's give it a minute. Um, and when we are finished, uh, please leave this page on your mobile phone uh, because uh, we are going to have two or three more uh, similar exercises. That's all. Well, we have. 60 people on the call and 41 have answer. Uh, excellent, the rate has slowed down. So I will assume that that's as many people want to answer to this. So we have by far the most common discipline is computer science, but we do have a lot of people uh, from philosophy and social sciences as well. Uh, please, for, for, for those of you who are from philosophy, notice the disciplinary difference. Engineers and computer science, we often like to um, note the differences. Um, and we're going to be covering in a way something related to that. Uh, so what I will do today is uh, bring my interpretation of uh, how we can use history as a way of understanding AI ethics. Uh, I think in the past we have gone through similar struggles where technology has very quickly affected society and relations and we can learn from that to, to see what we should be doing now. Uh, and then we will discuss how uh, this uh, interpretation of history uh, can be used today to do an AI ethics, uh, AI regulation, looking at the impact on society. 
um, and a design and engineering process that we can use for this in particular, giving specific details about the methods that we are using and other people, other researchers are using with examples, case studies, uh, or how that has been used or can be used in practice. So a little bit of history. Um, I'd like to use the example of the first industrial revolution um, about a hundred in the mid 19th century, uh, where all over the world, but particularly in England, things were changing very, very quickly. So we were developing new materials, new forms of energy, were having a huge impact on increasing productivity, um, and of course, a lot of uh, social impact. Uh, in the middle of this, in 1852, uh, in London, Prince Alfred and Queen Victoria organized what was called uh, the Crystal Palace. This was an example of the ultimate technology of the time. This was a cusp of the Industrial Revolution. And this will be similar to what today we have the CES twin, um, conference that brings thousands of people together to look at the latest gadgets, the latest robots, latest AI system, etc. Um, but the Crystal Palace and the exhibition of 1852 was so successful uh, that the Queen and uh, Prince Alfred were able to fund what was called Albertopolis back then. Uh, this is uh, where today we have the Albert uh, Victoria Muse Art Museum that is the biggest art and design museum in the world. My school is just across the road. Um, this is all part of Imperial College London. We have the Royal College of Arts, Royal College of Music. Um, so these represented the success of the Industrial Revolution. But of course, Together with the Industrial Revolution, we had a very fast growing inequality. We had children, um, child slavery, we will call it today. We had increased amount of pollution and environmental damage. Now, recently we published uh, an article uh, in uh, Nature Machine Intelligence describing how these changes were interpreted uh, back in the 1800s, and what is what was at the core of this kind of business model. Uh, and one could describe all that in this diagram. So the principle back then in the 1800s and the first industrial revolution was that we could take as much as possible from the environment. This was all the resources, land, water, air, and pump it into the economy. So manufacturing will use all these resources and of course manufacturing and then the leftover products will go back to the environment. No? That will be all the waste um, from the economy. And this has been the, the core model for over a century. But because of the um, climate impact of all these um, extracting resources and pumping waste, etc. we have started looking at new models of circular economy. Uh, so this new way of integrating ethics, um, environmental ethics into the design of technology means that we should be removing as little as possible from this natural environment and dumping as little as possible uh, waste. So, this is how the ethics of technology evolve over the last um, few decades. In particular, this has grown since the, in the last 50 years. Uh, in 1969, they created the uh, Environmental Protection Act that has been taken on uh, in Europe and the UK. Uh, and this has been very influential. And again, this is all at the center of these new environmental ethics where we consider um, 
a natural environment as an important aspect of our well-being. Uh, but we have moved from that first industrial revolution, um, many call what is happening today, the fourth industrial revolution. And here uh, we can say data is the new oil, uh, information about users are what make, uh, makes um, the value of the largest companies in the world. Um, so we have Amazon, Apple, Google, or Alphabet. Uh, those companies are as valuable as they are because they uh, control uh, a lot of information about us. Uh, this information uh, has been valued at almost $10 per user per month, uh, according to IDC's uh, um, data analysis. Uh, this reflects a new perspective on the system that I showed before, where we are extracting resources from an extended kind of environment. So the human is now a resource to the economy. The human, uh, in addition to the natural resources, is a place where companies go to collect what will become the prime substance of their industry. And this includes, of course, our attention, our time, but it also includes uh, changes in behavior, uh, data collection and, and trading uh, of human experiences. Uh, so extracting uh, these uh, resources, the human as a resource, and then producing a waste that sometimes could be uh, is associated to ill being, uh, reduced mental health, uh, reduced physical health, etc. So we are very aware of of the impact that technology has on our experiences, and uh, the general public and many companies are uh, looking for ways of bringing a new ethics, an ethics that is appropriate for the, this fourth industrial revolution that takes into account the human, the human experience uh, in, in better ways. So here I will talk a little bit about how we can explore more in detail this impact uh, on the human. Uh, and again, if you are more interested, uh, interested in going more deeply into this, uh, you can go to Nature Machine Intelligence, this article that came up very recently. Um, now, when you look at the environmental impact assessments, the ones that are about making uh, the world more sustainable, uh, we generally refer to infrastructure projects uh, like bridges, nuclear plants, uh, factories, new urban developments, etc., And these are all very slow or static. So once you put a bridge or now once you put a shopping center, uh, they hardly change. On the other hand, when you are building a new software system, they're very dynamic. Uh, they have artificial intelligence and they are retrained uh, constantly. So they are constantly changing. When you look at the environmental impact assessment, it has no, it has boundaries, right? I put a bridge, the bridge is going to be in a very specific location and it's not going to move. On the other hand, when I'm talking about software, it's completely unbounded. We have companies uh, that, whose software basically impacts uh, a large percent of humanity. Uh, the em environmental impact assessment generally is very anticipatory, it's about predicting what could be the possible impact. Uh, this is really not possible when you're talking about AI or software systems uh, because of the nature of changing so much. So we have to adapt and have a, a very iterative kind of process. Uh, in the first one, nature was a main resource, while in the, in the new one, humans are the, the most important resource. Um, but one thing that is very important is that for environmental impact assessment, we have a long history. We know, and there's a lot of research about what works and what doesn't work, what kind of practices we can use within companies, 
uh, what kind of uh, approaches we can take with government, with regulation, etc. What works, what doesn't work. Uh, in the case of artificial intelligence, we are still developing. We have a lot of discussions. We have new courses like this one, where uh, our community comes together to to discuss uh, different ideas on how this could or should be done. So I would like to go again to the mentee, and I would like to ask you: What are the values do you think uh, a human impact assessment should protect? So um, if you Please go here. Let's see what you guys uh, have to say. So go to menti.com and use the code 1135 And Let's see the answers coming in. What are the, the values do you think a human impact assessment should protect? I love how with large groups like this one, you can see a lot of terminologies. And when you see terms that are similar to the ones you were going to type, try to use the same one so we can relay, for example, human autonomy to autonomy are roughly the same. So for those of you who are just joining now, please go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, and use the code 1135 sit sits And we can see what people think are the values that we should use in an impact assessment. Fabulous, okay. So you can see, well, we pick up the last answers, is that there is a relatively good consistency, you know, autonomy, uh, freedom, human autonomy, it's quite big. Then we have privacy, uh, democracy, um, generally rights, that will include probably fairness and human dignity. Um, those seems to be health, uh, seem to be the, the, the the most commonly used ones. I can see well-being, safety, etc. So let's do one more. What would you uh, measure to judge if the values are are being satisfied in a, in a system that you want to assess? specific measures right because we have the values but then if you want to create legislation to uh, measure and determine if a system is supporting these values what are the the ways you will actually measure it now this is uh, particularly useful for engineers who have to build software systems yeah what are the metrics that you guys will use
Very good. I think the rate of answers can slow down enough. So um, satisfaction, happiness, trust, redistribution, well-being seem to be uh, some of the key measures. Oh, there's some more coming in. Okay, let's give it another few seconds. All right, very good. So you're all seeing there uh, satisfaction, happiness, uh, well being. Uh, those seem to be quality of life key keywords for most people. All right, we can come back in case people keep adding responses, but we can go now to the presentation. And you will see that what you are telling us is uh, very much at the core of what doctors and patients, the biomedical ethics that we expect regulates the relationship between doctors and patients. So there, uh, do no harm, well-being, human autonomy, and fairness um, are key principles that all um, basically health practitioners should follow. And there's increasing research that shows that AI ethics frameworks are uh, approximating or leading towards uh, these same sort of ethical principles. Um, personally, I think it's partially at least because we increasingly recognize that when you use uh, the human as a resource, as it happens sometimes in, in particular biomedical context, uh, we need to have principles uh, that kind of maintain um, the relationships uh, with, between providers and, uh, and those who receive those services. Uh, this is quite particularly important in countries where you have private medical systems. So you have the, the tensions between commerce, if you want, uh, and um, uh, and you are offering uh, an improvement on the person's health and well-being. And this is the same that it's happening in many engineering contexts. Uh, and this has been the, the motto, if you want, of our research lab for the last uh, almost 10 years, um, that all technologies should be designed to support psychological well-being. Uh, and this research interest has been part of uh, my work or my lab's work um, for some time. Uh, Positive Computing was a, a book that we published about five, six years ago um, on uh, design approaches to support well-being and how we can well, we explore the literature coming from psychology, coming from economics and from design research and how that could be brought into actual design practice. Now, if you are going to um, set the goals of your research group as being uh, to support well-being through technology, you need to have a very clear understanding of what you mean by psychological well-being. And there's a number of models uh, that we have used in, in our research. I guess the most common one is the clinical model. And this is where you go, for example, to, the, to your GP and you say, oh, I'm not eating well, uh, I can't sleep. And the doctor will ask you a few other questions um, based on these uh, standard questionnaires, uh, some of which are called the uh, CSD or the PHQ-9, um, these assessments uh, will determine if you are, for example, depressed or anxious, etc. cetera. Um, these measures of clinical ill-being uh, are so trusted, if you want, that insurance companies will actually pay uh, when you are below certain score and they will pay for treatment, for medication, etc. 
uh, but back in the late 1990s, a number of academics, uh, practitioners, uh, criticized uh, this particular clinical model and started a movement called positive psychology that looked into what uh, are the ways that we can use to identify those people who are thriving. Um, we all know people that um, have very high resilience, who do very well, uh, seem to be happy uh, constantly. So we want to understand what are the factors that drive this um, well-being and then develop interventions that can be used for the population more widely. Uh, some of these um, approaches include socio-emotional intelligence, so the understanding that understanding our own emotions uh, and using that to regulate, uh, to moderate our behaviors um, is useful to have a better life, to do better in life. And emp empathy, understanding other people's emotions and using that in regulating ourselves and regulating communication, it's also useful to improve well-being. The other approaches like self-determination theory, of which I'm going to come back in a second, uh, that believe that there are basic psychological needs that need to be satisfied in order for the person to, to thrive, to do well. Uh, economists have done a lot of work in this space and they use subjective well-being measures. Um, this one developed partially by Ed Diener and Daniel Kahneman, the Nobel Prize winner, uh, consists in asking people directly about their experiences. Um, how are you doing? How have you been doing the last week? Uh, that sort of questions. There is also uh, models coming out from neuroscience and psychophysiology uh, that you can use, for example, to assess the impact of an intervention. So Richard Davidson uh, has, for example, created intervention, mindfulness interventions, and you can use MRIs or psychophysiology equipment to see the before and after the intervention to see what is the impact. So these are all different models that engineers and designers can bring into uh, ways of assessing their products or assessing the, the positive or negative impact that technologies can have on us. We have found um, self-determination theory and its concept of basic psychological needs particularly useful. Uh, one of these needs is autonomy, the feeling of willingness and volition in action. Uh, we generally, in engineering and computer science, talk about uh, machine intelligence, but here it's all about human autonomy rather than machine autonomy. Um, the second one is the sense of competence, the sense of being able and effective and engaging with a particular behavior of what the technology is asking us to do. For those working in human factors or human computer interaction, this is very similar to what we call usability or includes what we call usability. Uh, if you have a system that has bad usability, people do not feel competent at using it. Uh, so they will tend to disengage, it doesn't support their well being, etc. Finally, the third psychological need is relatedness. All human beings. Uh, seek to feel connected to others. Um, now these three basic psychological needs have been found common across cultures, so across different age groups. There is evidence in uh, education on how these psychological needs support motivation and engagement. There is evidence in clinical practice on how they can be used to support rapport building between doctors and patients. It has been used in workplaces to see how employees engage with their jobs or not. Um, it has been used in uh, all uh, human domains, it's in the, all its domains of human experience. So within this, we have been developing methods uh, that 
we call the sphere of, of or use the concept of spheres in the technology experience. Uh, so I'm going to briefly summarize this one. You can find more details in the paper at the bottom of the page. Uh, and there are six spheres that we consider. Um, I will start with the second one, interface. Uh, the interface is the one that we tend to think about when we talk about human and computer interaction and design. This is when you design a mobile phone uh, or a mobile phone app. Uh, it consists on the menus, on the options that we provide in, in that particular interface in the interaction. Uh, in, in these tools, we also create sometimes tasks. Uh, that lead to the encompassing behavior. For example, uh, if I am creating a, a Fitbit, the interface will be the menu either on the watch or on the mobile app that gives me uh, the option to look at the number of steps and graphs, etc. Um, then there is tasks like step counting um, that are possible thanks to, to the technology. But all of that is part of a larger behavior uh, that could be, for example, um, the series of things I do with the intention to improve my health. So doing exercise is a behavior. And within the, the exercise, I might engage with a number of tasks, you know, that from dressing with clothing to particular equipment, to counting my steps, to uh, go do the actual running, to warming up, to stretching, etc. Now, all these uh, behaviors uh, will have an impact on the life sphere. This is uh, the things that we refer to when we talk about quality of life. Um, there are certain behaviors that will be healthy behaviors. There are certain behaviors that are unhealthy. Um, so we need to be able to assess at the life level, if they're having a positive impact or not. Now, all of these uh, four spheres that I just mentioned refer to the context of um, people interacting directly with the technology. Uh, but in addition, we have the adoption uh, that refers to the, the people uh, or the interaction or what we learn about the technology before we actually interact with it. So this could be word of mouth, could be marketing, and refers to the expectations about how the technology will satisfy these psychological needs. So I could have a messaging, uh, a marketing campaign that uh, highlights uh, the way in which this will support my sense of autonomy or competence or relatedness. And on the other side, we have, we have society. And this refers to the impact that the technology will have on people that may not even be using the technology. And so even if I don't use Facebook, Facebook will have an impact on me because it has an impact on democracy. It has an impact on what other people uh, feel and their emotions, etc. cetera. Uh, so, well, I have a the sequence there. For each of these spheres, we have developed questionnaires uh, that generally are adaptations of those that have been already widely tested in, in the psychological literature. I, I don't intend for you to read this table in detail, but you can see here how for each of these spheres, you have tools, instruments that you can use to understand and measure the impact that your technology is having uh, at that level. Uh, defining these fears also helps us understand what we are talking about. So when we talk about increased autonomy, uh, we can see that there is uh, different levels. So we, we can have a conversation between uh, different professionals about uh, what we, we refer to when we use that word. Um, All this uh, model that I just described, well, it's being used and it's been developed in order to improve uh, design practice more generally. So I think I would like to take a 
a few questions now to take a little break to, uh, and see uh, where we are at with you and your understanding. And yeah, thank you, Rafael. So we agree with Rafael that I will go through the chat and see uh, there's a number of comments and questions. So maybe I could go from the beginning. And uh, there's uh, one interesting question, which is the following. I just read it. It's from Elena Jones. Quantifying these things is such an important approach. However, is the satisfaction of this value even quantifiable? It seems a lot of things are indirect, which can have many confounded. For example, happiness might be impacted by convenience of technology that might unfairly exploit others, depending on geography, nations, and etc. Any comments on that? Yes, uh, you are very right. I think uh, uh, any sort of measure is is very difficult, and sometimes it could even be misuse. Um, that's why also uh, that doesn't mean that it's not useful. Uh, when you are a designer, you need to understand if your design is having a positive or a negative impact. And the only way to do that is, is to use some sort of measures. Of course, these measures will need to be iterated on. Uh, one has to be very aware of its limitations. Um, I, otherwise one runs the risk of taking a too technocratic, uh, you could say, approach. Um, this is being used in policy making. So in Europe, in the UK, in the US, uh, economists are using similar well-being measures uh, to influence policy making and decision making in the uh, government and and corporate investments. Um, of course, these measures could be improved, uh, uh, but I think there is a lot of value on kind of broadly guiding the type of development we do. Uh, with regards to the social impact on other communities, that's why in, in our last sphere we include society. No? So even the people who don't use your technology will be impacted. And I think it's important um, to consider them, even if uh, the measures might not be precise or sufficient, uh, they are still useful. Thank you. Um, here's a comment and a question. So a comment was from Pedro that said, quality of life is an established parameter in medicine specific methods established for these approaches. And then we have a question from Saman that said, well, preventing pain, suffering, etc., is of course somehow measurable, but satisfaction, pleasure, happiness, as one common metric is rather strange. Um, you also think it's rather strange? Uh, no, not really. Uh, I think, um depends on how you de define happiness. Uh, so for millennia, we have made a distinction be, between two terms. Uh, one is what we normally today talk about happiness, that it's hedonic well-being. This is a, our emotional well-being. Um, this is a sort of well-being that you get when you eat a chocolate or ice cream. Um, and, and, and we generally, will agree that that is not a sufficient uh, d definition of well-being because if you eat too much chocolate or ice cream, you get sick. So you have to look, look in the longer term. There's another definition of well-being that is eudaimonic well-being. Uh, that's a term that Aristotle um, defined. And it has to do with finding meaning in life to uh, having a broader picture of uh, including relationships and um, other attributes that come in into the way of life. Um, so yeah, I think focusing too much on hedonic well-being for interventions that 
span possibly a life uh, is, is is not a good thing. You need to take into account a, a bigger picture. Uh, I will add to that the same as I said before, these measures, we cannot take, uh, take them religiously, uh, but they are very useful for uh, those building the products as a way of um, deciding if they are positive, if they are having a positive impact or not. Thank you. Uh, if you want, we can have two more questions, um, if you're good with that. Yes, sure. Uh, Norman is uh, suggesting a, another theory called SCARF, status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness and fairness. Are you familiar with that? Or if yes, do you have any comment on that? Uh, not particularly. There are, someone did a survey recently of all the ethical frameworks being used for AI. I'm not sure if this one is particularly uh, used for AI, but I can see their autonomy and fairness. So they will be very similar to uh, the ones I mentioned, the one I mentioned on uh, that it's related to the biomedical uh, ethics framework. Um, there are other ethical frameworks that have 12 or, or more categories, more principles. Um, different organizations are developing their own. So the European Commission has one, uh, the IEEE um, has another one, uh, the ethics in action. So we are all seeking um, guidance on, on the things that we should take into account. Um, I believe that they all have their benefits. I have found the biomedical ethics, again, as a very useful one, because there is a lot of literature about the advantages and disadvantages, many of which are, by the way, the ones that people, the questions before highlighted, no? And it's the problem of quantifying well-being. No? Uh, health professionals have struggle uh, with such issues for some time. So one can go to that literature uh, and use it uh, to improve our own practices in engineering. Thank you. Uh, well, it seems that your talk is interesting because there's a lot of questions coming up, which is always a very good sign. Uh, I will take only one and then maybe we'll come back at the end of your talk for more questions. There is uh, a question from Bologna that says, it's, a, it's about your sphere uh, model. And she asks, is it always necessary to use all the dimension of the spheres to measure the impact of technology? Well, I, I think as engineers, uh, particularly if you're working in industry, uh, or even if you're an academic, uh, we have limitations based on time and budget. So when we get to the case studies section, I'm going to describe how we have brought it into our own practice. Um, and of course, it is not possible to measure all these fears um, because uh, the timelines, because the budgets of our projects just do not allow it. Uh, now, if uh, if you are Google or Facebook or a company like that, and you are deploying uh, or maintaining a system that has a wide impact, uh, yes, I would like to see all these fears being analyzed. Um, if you are making a product that is a much smaller scale, that it will only reach a few thousand people, um, then obviously looking at all the spheres might not be possible. Thank you, Rafa. I think it will stop for the second and then let you continue with the presentation. And at the very end, we'll have uh, time for a number of questions again on this part and the new one. Thank you so much, Roberto. All right. So what I will go into more detail now is into actual processes uh, that engineers and designers uh, can use to assess the impact that the technology will have on, on human, both the, uh, users and non-users. So it's related 
to the sort of conversations that we were just having. Uh, I have one more question here. What development process do you follow? So given that uh, maybe half of you guys are in engineering and computer science, you will be uh, often involved in developing um, you know, systems. So what kind of practices do you follow? Just write some keywords of, of the methods that are most common, or maybe that you, even if you are not currently using, that you you have learned when you were at school. So if there is people just joining, you have to go to menti.com and use the code 11356 Excellent. You can see there's a lot of commonality. So a lot of people used to agile type methodologies, some design thinking approaches, um, customer journeys, requirement analysis, requirement management, etc. So the, the reason I was running this survey is because you can see there are commonalities, but there is also a huge variety because if you go to different organizations, Agile will be used in different ways. Um, trial and error design thinking approaches also change from organization to organization. Uh, and this has, uh, well, there's a very long, description there from computer science. Uh, so these different approaches to software development means that it's very hard for us to come with a single method uh, that brings ethics uh, in standardized way. So if you are someone like the IEEE or uh, any organization, that wants to have an impact on industry, it is very difficult to find a methodology that everybody will feel comfortable because it will be impossible to, to tell people from so many different disciplines or, and different organizations to change the way they go about work to incorporate ethics. So this has been a concern in our work. Okay. I think more than half of the people has answered. So and there's a lot of consistency. So I'm going to switch back to the slides. We took the double diamond approach that I'm going to describe now uh, because it's a very commonly used methodology with this, within design and design thinking. Uh, this also ha has a lot of commonality with what you will use in traditional engineering, including agile methodologies. Um, but I, what I'm going to describe today is just one approximation uh, that you can adapt to whatever methodology uh, you accustom to using. 
So the first one, research, uh, investigates the needs, preferences, contexts, and lives of the people who will be observed or who are going to be using uh, this particular technology. Uh, actually, not just using, because this could include the direct stakeholders, these are the people who use the platform, but also the indirect stakeholders, who are people who will be influenced by it, but not directly interacting with the platform. Um, so, in, in this uh, divergent, we call it stage, you are trying to broaden your view and your understanding about uh, these different groups of stakeholders. You are trying to understand your problem as well as possible. Then we have a convergence stage. Uh, this is what we call the insight stage, and this is where you analyze the data and synthesize into particular problem definitions and insights that can be useful in the, in the actual design. And this is where we first will bring uh, well-being considerations, uh, where we can use, for example, the research literature uh, on how a technology impacts well-being, and we can start saying, well, this series of type of approaches will benefit this group, might disadvantage this other one, uh, and so on. Uh, this will also um, be useful, um, or it's an important stage for considering ethics. No? So you can start looking at the possible risks, uh, for example, of bias or unfairness, uh, the tensions, for example, possibly between privacy and um, safety, uh, and, and understanding these problems and the possible consequences, both of well-being and ethics more generally, uh, is a first stage in the research. Then you have the ideation, where you start looking at solutions to these problems. Uh, uh, this is where you again take a divergent approach and you can try to put on the on the table as many uh, design ideas as possible. And in this, uh, you can also use uh, the well-being literature and ethical framing as way of broadening your solution space because you are bringing ideas, concepts, literature on how other people have uh, approached um, such ethical challenges uh, so, and, and trying to bring it into your specific product or possible solutions. So after this diversion, you have a final uh, phase of conversion where you start building a particular design solutions, a prototype. And when you build a particular prototype, uh, you could pilot it, you could test it up to see with a particular a small cohort of people to see if it could have a negative impact on their health or if it could have cons impact on some of your ethics principles that you now you had not considered before. Uh, this will ideally involve both direct and indirect stakeholders, no, not just the people that are interacting with your, with your toolkit with your system. Now, uh, engineers, we uh, have to be concerned also when we deploy this into the wider population, uh, how uh, this will have an in what, what sort of impact this has. Uh, and this one is very difficult sometimes to predict because in software uh, technology more generally, we know that users are very likely to adapt these technologies to their particular context, to use the technologies that we have created in ways that we did not expect. Um, so evaluating the impact on health and well-being, evaluating um, the impact that this might have on relationships, on governance, etc., uh, requires that we do it after deployment as well. It requires that we see uh, the technology in actual use. And by this, I, I mean, obviously, 
uh, using approaches or research methodologies like ethnographies, uh, but also uh, quantitative approaches. So going back to the, the ideas that I described at the beginning, the core of environmental impact assessments is to think before you do it. Uh, one way of doing that is to uh, write impact statements. This is a very common practice and it's actually mandatory in many jurisdictions when you put forward uh, a large civil engineering project. Um, and in many ways, this is the sort of thing that we would like to see in other technology, in technology design. So we can look at the different approaches that governments and organizations have taken. So the uh, environmental impact assessment uh, often follows this methodology that you see here. So the first step is screening. Does a proposal even require an environmental impact assessment? If it's a very small civil engineering project, uh, I don't know, if you want to put an extension on the back of your house, maybe it doesn't require any sort of environmental impact assessment. But if you're putting a nuclear plant uh, near a big city, you probably do. Well, you most certainly do. Um, scoping. What is, are the environmental impacts that need to be examined? I might be going to consider only but what is the different groups of stakeholders assessment what is is this impact significant in any particular way um, mitigation what can be done to address that adverse impact uh, then we will do a, a review of this. Is this assessment adequate or should be consider um, other aspects? And sometimes the focus in environmental impact assessment is on the my company wants to put in a building or a bridge or this civil engineering project. Really important. And finally, more member impact assessment blow up and see what happened after. In, and this is similar to what I did for our technology impact. For, this becomes very difficult. Because when people talk about implementations and deployments, sometimes they're talking about different things. So many of you are computer scientists, so you will be focused on developing AI algorithms. This is one particular aspect of a software implementation you're actually coding, and you might be using uh, agile methodologies or other sorts of methodologies for developing uh, the core of this system. But these systems eventually will be adapted to different markets. So depending on what you're doing, uh, it will be adapted to, for example, a security application or possibly for a health and marketing. So if you're building on algorithms for surveillance, let's say facial recognition, this can be used on security, health, marketing. If you are developing algorithms for classifying documents uh, like curriculums or CVs, uh, you you could be using them in different vertical sectors now. So you have um, an adaptation for people seeking jobs in computer science programming, or you will have one for banking jobs and another one for services industries. So there are adaptations to whole sectors. And finally, your system is likely to be adapted again for a particular user. No, for a government, let's say we are talking again about facial recognition and security. Uh, this might be adapted for the government of a particular country or state or 
uh, municipality. If you're talking about health, you might be developing electronic medical records and surveillance within electronic medical records, and you might adapt this to different NHS trusts or hospitals, etc. And the same for marketing. This Algorithms and these adaptations in industry will be customized for each particular client. So which ones do we regulate? This is a very difficult question. And it's difficult because sometimes the models we use come from the environmental impact assessment that I discussed earlier for big infrastructure civil engineering projects. But the cost of such projects, the, the approach to innovation is very different. So in software projects, you will have a very high cost at the beginning, right? So when you're developing the algorithms, you, you need to include things like collecting the data that you use to train the algorithms. That's a huge cost. Then you need to do the training, customizing, figuring out which classification algorithm is the best, uh, and, and then build big infrastructure, uh, big software systems from there. Adapting to a particular market is a much smaller job, but of course it's still quite costly because you have to have the know-how from that particular industry. This is what we call in software engineering, software application frameworks. So you're basically building a software application framework that has a core of functionalities, but in addition to that, you are building the know-how of that particular industry or the particular way in the, and type of problems. Uh, that you have in that context, no? this, uh, what we call sometimes design patterns. Finally, uh, you have that the customization for a particular client can be very uh, cheap in a way, because sometimes it's just about putting a logo for a different customer. So you have a solution that you solve, I don't know, for the state of Montana, and then you want to sell it to a Washington state, and it's just about changing the, the branding, or templating, and so on. Um, in infrastructure project, this is completely different. The design of a bridge is relatively cheap compared to the actual building of the bridge. The design of the a big residential or commercial tower is relatively cheap compared to the millions and millions of dollars that it costs to build. So the process of innovation, of creation and production from software systems is very different to those in uh, big civil infrastructure projects. So obviously the, the ways of assessing the impact have to take this into account. Um, again, which of these three um, sides or aspects of the technology developing should we regulate and this is quite an important consideration because as you will see different um, approaches that have been proposed uh, by organizations across the world uh, focus on, on different levels for example the algorithmic impact assessment that the ai now institute has developed has been fantastic for the later stage. So the, this impact assessment focuses on the procurement. So the public agencies are asked to uh, buy products, let's say facial recognition systems or security systems or electronic medical records in ways that respect um, this particular process, you know, that follow this particular process. So there will be a pre-acquisition review. This is when you write a tender and it allows the agency uh, to identify the issues that they want to, uh, or they should consider. No? They consult with the public, um, they show the tender and say, well, we want, uh, uh, let's say, a facial recognition system that uh, is within these constraints, no? that has no bias or, uh, it has this approach to fairness or etc this approach to privacy in, in this case uh, initial agency disclosure requirements here the the agency that is going to buy the platform needs to consider the the possible issues that arise huh? that if they do go ahead and 
and, and buy uh, any of these of the systems they expect to to be offered by companies, what are the potential issues that come up? And then there will be a comment where the public can engage in the process. The literature on environmental impact assessment from civil engineers the most important of all, um, because this is what improve their products. Uh, it's not just about getting better or not, it gives uh, an iteration where they can hear from other so help people make products. It will be of uh, the, the uh, public um, can challenge, I guess, each other, no? but mostly the public challenge in the agency. Um, uh, this also acknowledges that it's an iterative process of so renewing uh, such impact assessments on a regular timetable. So giving uh, the agency, government agency and the public the opportunity to review, let's say every 12 months, decisions about a par the particular technology, the particular product. The other frameworks that uh, have been used um, by organizations. Digital Catapult is a center for innovation here in the UK. Uh, I should disclose that I'm uh, joining them next month as part of their uh, ethics committee. Uh, and this ethics committee uh, uses uh, this framework, you know, that it's about being first, being clear about the benefits of the product and service. So, sorry, this process is target if you want to the early stages so this is for the startups when they're beginning to create their products no um, so it's not so much for the let's say agency or for the client uh, engaging in looking at better at improving the procurement but it's about startups for improving their ethics uh, processes so the first one is identifying what are the benefits, who it benefits, how it benefits, uh, different stakeholders, et cetera. Then obviously identifying and managing the risk, you know, identifying that, well, maybe there could be a security risk, it could be a risk of bias or being unfairness or a risk of having a negative impact on society. Um, data is a particular important one. Um, uh, especially in the AI industry, data is often considered uh, the core asset um, of the organization. So the way you collect it, the way you manage it, the way you um, secure it uh, are all very important aspects of this uh, responsible innovation. Uh, then you look at how you can help organizations be worthy of trust. What does trust mean for them? What does trust mean for the different stakeholders in the industry, etc.? We want to be able to promote diversity, equality, and inclusion. So looking with the organization, with the company, on how they can bring that into, for example, the development teams. How can they have a more diverse workforce and how that can help uh, them build better products that take into account a broader set of perspectives, um, also about the stakeholders they, they are targeting. Um, communications, how we can help organizations communicate their values, uh, communicate the benefits of their products and the risks of their products. Uh, and finally, considering all this into their business model. If um, being able to communicate in, in, in the business model uh, or seeking in the business model the best approaches to resources uh, and waste that I described before. So we want to see if, if it is really the only way to use humans as a resource or there might be other approaches. So for example, instead of commercializing the data from the users, uh, 
giving the products for free, like it happens, let's say in Gmail, uh, you might find that the subscription model, uh, it, it's a better one, that it ends up being more ethical or um, have a more positive impact on your stakeholders. Uh, <clears throat> So within this, you obviously all this impact assessment can carry a large significant cost to technology organizations. So we want to find ways of screening and reducing the workload, both on the organizations themselves, but also on the regulators. Um, we want to see, for example, uh, if technology is promising to support health and well-being, well, if you're selling that as part of your offer, um, then you should look for ways to making sure that that actually happens. If a technology uh, is uh, mostly, or, or if there is a body of evidence, academic evidence, peer review evidence that supports uh, some of you arguments, for example, that it promotes well-being, well, that's very useful, but also if there is evidence from the recent call or the environment, then you also need to do um, an impact assessment. A third group that sometimes we forget about is um, technologies that are developed for vulnerable populations. Um, technologies that are built for people with a chronic illness or for low income, or uh, people that are in situations of being controlled. Um, the advantage of these screening rules is that they are very easy to apply. Of course, there are disadvantages uh, that include that new technologies, especially in software industry, that everything moves so quickly. Technologies, some technologies might not be included. Of course, many companies will say that is, this is adding bureaucracy and it will slow innovation. So this is something that has happened in the older environmental impact assessments. And then, of course, uh, in Spanish we say, echa la regla, echa la trampa. That means when you create a rule, there will be ways of breaking it. Um, but this is also called salami slicing. You know, it's one of the approaches to do that. You can always find ways of describing uh, the possible impact in ways that are below the threshold that will trigger um, the requirement for an impact assessment. <clears throat> so now I would like to discuss some methods that we or other people have used for environmental protection. The process uh, of eliciting behavioral change uh, is, has been studied in environmental impact assessment very widely. And we know that organizations are more likely to change their behavior and become more ethical or become more sustainable when they have the right skills. And this is why courses like this one, like what Roberto is doing today is so important because when researchers, when people in organizations, in industry, understand the importance of taking account ethics in the design of their systems, when they know about methodologies that they can use in their product making processes, they are more likely to do it. I believe that we humans are generally good by nature, uh, but sometimes we, um, don't know or don't realize the impact of our behaviors on other people. So the evidence from the EPA shows that this is uh, very important. The process matters a lot in the sort of behavioral outcomes that you achieve. Um, and we want to measure the impact uh, on direct stakeholders, but this is sometimes very difficult uh, and very expensive. Uh, this happens in the pharmaceutical industry. So when you uh, create a new drug, uh, you need to go through a very uh, complex process of approvals and testing. And until uh, the company shows that there is no significant risk to harm, 
uh, and that it has a positive impact on well-being. And you do these things through uh, randomized controlled trials and quite sophisticated methodology. Only after you go through all these processes, you are able to release your products to the market. So in health, we know that measuring impact is difficult and expensive, but we also know that it's necessary. Otherwise, uh, profit trumps all those ethical pr principles that we described before. Uh, in technology design, uh, we have developed methodologies of value sensitive design. Uh, it's a set of methodologies very theory grounded methodologies developed um, over 20 years ago by Batya Friedman and her team in um, University of Washington. Uh, these methodologies can be used to identify uh, and work with stakeholders eliciting their values uh, and eliciting ways in which they can be brought into the, the actual technologies. And this includes both direct stakeholders, those that interact with the technology, and indirect organizations and society more widely. So I'm going to tell you now a little bit about a few case studies of products that we have built uh, and others built by other people on how these um, methodologies have been used. Uh, one that is a very successful, and it only came up last week, is the work that Ada Lovelace Institute in London is doing around COVID-19. So the Ada Lovelace released last week a report that will be similar to what I call uh, an, an impact assessment, a human impact assessment, on uh, the different technologies being used to address um, our pandemic, the current pandemic. Uh, they look at three technologies, they brought together 20 experts from across different disciplines and they looked at symptom tracking. Uh, these are apps, technologies that um, people are using to, to track their symptoms. Even when you are healthy, you can write down that you have a headache or you have a sore throat or, or just, just doing fine. And this allows doctors to, to understand more about the illness and, and what precedes uh, the more obvious symptoms of the of the virus. This contact tracing uh, that we are all uh, now thinking about because it's considered one of the ways in which we will be able to go to normality. And these apps basically track uh, people uh, when they're healthy and then when they are not and the people that they have been in touch or in contact with. So when you have been in contact with someone who becomes ill, uh, the, you can be warned by the contact tracing app. And finally, immunity certification, are the technologies uh, that have already been used in some countries, like in China, uh, where your, for example, your mobile phone might give <coughs> evidence that you are healthy or not. <coughs> And in some extreme cases, uh, can be used for you to be able to access or to be denied access uh, to certain services like taking a train or going into a public space or getting into a building. Uh, and they had the Lovelace Institute brought people, experts from government and parliament and researchers sorry, they brought these uh, experts to provide advice to government and parliament and to the technology providers and developers who are creating these technologies. So I, I, I think this is a very nice example of how uh, impact assessment can be brought in a very fast, uh, rapid way uh, to inform the design of new technologies. In, in, in their report that I strongly recommend you, you have a look at, you can see their assessment on what is the social value um, that a particular technology has, like symptom tracking, versus the, the benefits um, that this technology might bring. And the different experts provided advice on, on how they assess or judge these values. So, just to give you a little bit more of detail 
uh, in the report, they say for contact tracing, the technical limitations, barriers to effective employment and social impact demands more consideration before digital contact tracing is deployed. This is particularly important because we are, uh, or the media and government sometimes are pushing for these technologies, but according to these experts, there is not enough evidence uh, about effectiveness. We need to take this into account. Government must establish and a group of advisors on technology in emergencies that will oversee the development of these technologies. And the effectiveness of a digital contact tracing app will be contingent on widespread public trust and confidence, which must translate into broad adoption of the app. Uh, this is where you know, trust in our government, trust in our organization is so important. When you have countries that have mixed messages about um, behavioral interventions, uh, this has a serious impact on how people will engage with the technologies. Now, and this applies not just to these three, but you could say that for like even face masks. Uh, when the, the government has mixed messages, they are less likely to be uh, used, uh, adopted, and then uh, the impact of these interventions will be reduced. Hello? Uh, so now I will uh, talk a little bit about a project that we have developed. Um, Headgear was a project funded by the Movember Foundation that was about improving uh, mental health in male-dominated workplaces. Um, and here you have a diagram of the design process we normally use, where we took into account, we do user research, so we interview people in, uh, in different contexts. Uh, our industries include uh, the police department, ambulance services, fire department, so very male-dominated workplaces. Uh, the male-dominated aspect uh, was partially because of the funding agency uh, and partially because males have a very different uh, kind of risk, mental health risk profile. Um, generally males, when they have mental health problems, are very are less likely to seek help than the female counterparts. So these organizations, male-dominated workplaces, are defined as those that have more than 70% males. So we interview and run participatory design workshops uh, in, in these workplaces. Then we build wireframes. We bring our mental health researchers and collaborators to the process, and we look at the functionalities of both the mental health researchers and the users one. Then we test the language and the graphic design. Then we release the prototype um, with a small group of users to make sure that the, the impact is as we expected. And we can launch and either run a randomized control trial or release it publicly. So the, for those of you who don't have experience in, in design practices, participatory processes, are activities where you engage with the stakeholders. So you bring, uh, you co-design with them. In this case, we interview or, or run workshops with firefighters in urban, suburban, and rural locations. Uh, rural and remote locations in Australia are very remote. Oh, so in some of these towns you have, uh, na your neighbors might be 100, 200 kilometers away. So it's something that, the, I don't think ever happens in, in Europe. Um, so in these participatory workshops, we went out to these remote places and we went to places in the city and talked with the uh, different stakeholders, both managers and employees of these companies uh, about their concerns, about their how they do manage currently mental health problems. And then we looked at possible uh, technological interventions. Now, what is important here is that if the app, if the technology is going to uh, say that they are going to improve your well being, this has to be tested. In our case, we did this through a clinical model of well being, like the one I described before. Uh, so these are very um, 
standardized measure. This one we use is called BHQ. Um, and we have a randomized control trial. So we had uh, an intervention, um, a version of the app that didn't have the active component. The active component that we built was um, a series of short psychoeducation and behavioral activation therapy interventions. So these were uh, activities generally lasted about five minutes and you had a, a 20 day challenge that you had to engage on. So we measure the impact on mental health, uh, on depression, five weeks, and then three months after the people had used the app. So this is kind of a long-term impact of the technology. Uh, and as you can see, we had a very positive impact. A second case study is with another organization called Reach Out in Australia. Um, Reach Out um, helps around 1.8 million young people in Australia who are going through difficult times. This includes issues of relationships, substance abuse, uh, coming out um, about being gay, for example, etc. So what one of the functionalities they have is peer support groups where people can go ask questions and will get feedback generally from people of their own age. But as you can imagine, if you have such a large number of people, managing a community is very difficult. Uh, so we build a natural language processing, a machine learning technique for automatically triaging um, the, the incoming posts. So our system will say this is uh, green, meaning doesn't need any response or is amber please respond when you can, or red, uh, this requires a response as soon as possible. And we even had uh, ultra red, a critical uh, label uh, that was for people who were talking about suicide or self-harm, and that triggered a special safety protocol. Uh, the system was very successful and it has been used for about 40 years. Here you have a screenshot of a standard post. So this, one, this user says, oh, like the title says, I feel crap because I put my mate in the hospital. So this one will be labeled automatically as red. And this system is retrained. So if the system had labeled it as green, for example, the, the human moderator might change the label to something else. And that same day, the system will be retrained. So it keeps learning from uh, the way that humans triage such content. One of the things, uh, the reasons I use this as a case study is because at the beginning, before the version that you're seeing now, uh, it was a failure in the project because we had not considered the somewhat more indirect stakeholders. So analyzing all the stakeholders is, is very significant. In the fail example that you're not seeing now, we had built a very, very good technology platform. We have natural language processing, uh, tools for recognizing um, different uh, kind of symptoms or illnesses. So the, it differentiated depression from anxiety for substance abuse, etc. And then it was able to generate automatic responses. But when we designed that system, we had not considered the impact the platform will have on the human moderators on the people that have to normally respond to, to those young people. Uh, so it basically after a, a year, uh, the adoption had been minimal and we redesigned it to build what you see now. And this one has been very successful. And then we took it because it was successful, we took it to build a, a chat system with some similarities. So these platforms, the use of AI here, can have a very, very positive impact on improving well-being. Uh, this one was about improving productivity and we increase the accuracy of the algorithms. We reduce the amount of time uh, that it takes to uh, respond by 80% in some of the labels for the critical, 80% for the red, 77% for the amber, and obviously less for uh, the, the messages labeled as green that are not as important. So you can see this very significant improvement in time 
uh, response time will have an impact on reducing the risk of uh, re on, on, on the user participants, on the peers. There are many initiatives looking at uh, parameters and principles for AI ethics. I strongly recommend things like the One AI Now Institute, the IEEE, uh, and I know Roberto is working on set inspection. Uh, so all these are some of the many global initiatives on AI ethics. Uh, yes, I also wanted to include one case that I have been thinking about lately, that is a fail, it's an example of failed responsibility. And this one is the, what is called VDR, or Video Dialogue Replacement. So these are companies, and you can look at some examples, that are building what I would call um, deep fakes. So you have a video and you can replace uh, what the person is saying with uh, a very high naturalism. Uh, and these are technologies that came up of making movies in Hollywood, but they uh, and now on they have some possible some positive applications, but most of the applications will have a very very serious negative social impact. So I personally think this is a, an example of fail responsibility. So a question I, I would like to leave you with is how can we prevent irresponsible design and engineering from happening? Um, how can we identify early on that certain type of technologies will have a negative impact on our well-being, on the way uh, we relate to others, on our societies? Uh, I think this will be a combination of regulation, technology push, and market pull. Um, and like I mentioned before, there is, it's very important um, to have courses like this one that help organizations, companies, and government to improve our understanding about these topics and how they can be addressed in the different contexts. So with that, I would like to finish and give some time for questions. Thank you, Rafael. I, at least me personally, truly enjoyed, uh, learned a lot, and I saw that there was a number of uh, question and discussion and people said great lecture so uh, you will see in the chat um let me go through the chat and basically um start giving you some uh, first of all the information pedro is mentioning that in norway a an app very similar to the one you were describing has been um, already um addressed and it was implemented already there's a question here from Fotis. If certain moral well-being and etc. terms are quantifiable, it should be possible to use advanced algorithm or weak AI for decision making on ethical issues. Is this ethical? Hmm. Interesting question. I think ethical decisions in, need to involve uh, a broad spectrum of social um, stakeholders, of actual humans. Um, I can see in some cases there might be an application of AI and I, see, I think that can be useful because there might be patterns that repeat themselves across different social groups. So um, concerns about privacy in one country might be similar to other ones and we might find that those patterns are useful to make uh, design or procurement decisions. Uh, but I still think that you always have to, have to go back to humans. One important difference between the environmental impact assessments that I mentioned before about nature uh, and the current ones that are the human impact assessment is that we cannot ask nature about their experience of, of their thinking. But the core of our kind of liberal, Western liberal philosophies and ethics is that we can and should be asking humans about their experiences, about 
uh, how something has an impact on them or what their opinions are. So it's, it's I would say it's almost an ethical requirement to always be involved in the, the, the public more broadly. Thank you, Rafael. Um, there's a number of questions. So let me go to the last one because I go backwards from Rebu. How important is interpretability or explainability to evaluate ethical AI? And where should we incorporate into the design process? Yeah, very good question. I think there has been a lot of emphasis on explicability, interpretability, and I think it is very important. I will put that uh, within um, what I call competence. Actually, often it's a combination of both competence and autonomy. So when we are able to uh, understand how a system made a decision, it helps uh, um, promote or helps or supports my sense of competence on why I should or should not do something. So if I have a system like the contact tracing app uh, that explains uh, why I'm being told that I could be at risk, uh, that will help my sense of competence on an understanding on why I need to go to the hospital to get tested for the virus. Um, so if the algorithm somehow determined that I am at risk, I would like to know why. Uh, and that helps what I call sense of competence and sense of autonomy. I will be more likely to engage. So I think it's, it's particularly important because it contributes to engagement with the technology and it supports some of those psychological needs. Um, yes. Yeah, thank you, Rafael. A uh, bunch of more questions, so if you feel like answering, um, if you're good with that. Yes, yes, of course. Excellent. So from Ioana, she, uh, the question is, artificial intelligence tries to measure the subjective elements such as satisfaction. Right now, data scientists are working with psychologists, philosophers, etc. How important do you think this type of professionals in terms of relevance in the team? What is more or less the percentage of this type of professional in the IT team? So the question is very interesting. In a team that is composed of several people, what is the, the, the weight of the non, let's say, technical people with respect to, let's say, the data scientists in your experience? Well, in my experience, I will say as a rule in all my projects, I involve uh, people with know-how, detailed know-how of the stakeholders uh, that will be impacted by the technology. So when we build the app that I mentioned before for workplace mental health, we engage with experts in workplace mental health. We engage with managers and employees. We engage uh, with different experts in that domain. Uh, when we work on apps for asthma, the same. When we work on us for uh, insomnia. So in each of these technologies, we work with different groups of experts. Most recently, I have been working at the Liberhume Center for the Future of Intelligence with philosophers and sociologists that had never worked before. And it has been a wonderful experience. So we have been doing reviews of different technologies. Uh, and the philosophers can bring a perspective that is very different, very new for someone like myself who have been generally working more with engineers and computer scientists. Um, one of my closest collaborators in the recent years has been uh, Richard Ryan, who is a psychologist. 
Uh, so he has been helping us develop models like the methods model that I mentioned today. So I think those collaborations are essential. I, I couldn't put a figure on the proportions that I think was part of the question. Um, I think it just has to be a wide mix. Thank you. Um, there's a very interesting question from Chris, which I also share. Maybe we can prevent irresponsible design and engineering in Europe. But other regions, I guess you mentioned other regions of the world, have another idea how the future should look like. So will they do whatever they like to do? How can we, and I assume we means us into a Western uh, democratic uh, society, prevent that our work will not be undermined? Well, this question is really two faults because is you know, if I might allow to make a comment because on one end is looking at us into our Western, uh, let's say, um, society with human rights as a basic for democracy. And, and at the same time is considering that the world has different uh, systems. So how the things that you would uh, be describing might or might not have an impact within our system and outside our system? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I think over the history, humanity's history, we have always had situations we, where uh, technologies and values had been interpreted and understood in different ways. Uh, and that has not had a negative impact overall on us. Um, I think as well, um, these processes that I described make products better. So it will actually help uh, the companies that follow them. Doesn't matter if they are from different cultures, different countries, if uh, they follow certain rules or not. In the long term, I personally think such processes will have, will make better products. And that's the same that happens with environmental practices. Um, I think in the longer term, products that are more sustainable will uh, be more successful people will appreciate them. Um, so obviously I'm not naive. I, I, I do believe that there are pros and cons, but uh, I think overall uh, it helps, these processes help us make better products. Um, I'm not sure if I answered completely the question, but that that's my perception of this. Some of the models I describe, uh, self-determination theory has been tested across cultures and age groups. Uh, so psychological needs like autonomy, competence, relatedness are valued all over the world by all humans. Uh, so I think that's that makes it even more useful for our design practice. Thank you, Rafa. Um, let's say we have a, a time for a few more questions, if you, if you are with, with that. Sure, yes. Um, there's one question that goes back to the first part of, I'll, I'll go back to a question on the second part, but there was one question on the first part of your talk that I partially initiated and there was a discussion in the chat. In your impact assessment, you make a distinction between well-being and ethics. But in several proposals that are being kind of written recently, well-being is mostly part of ethical uh, requirements. So why are you making the distinction between the two? Is there any particular reason for doing that? Thanks. Uh, yeah, it's a very good question. Um... I agree, as you saw in part of my lecture, I do include well-being as a core ethical principle. Um, and, and then I think you're probably referring to the double diamond 
where I have kind of two processes. One is well-being and the other one ethics, as if they were different. Uh, but generally, one is included in the other one. Uh, so I think you could easily bring them together. It's just sometimes a matter of um, communication uh, and trying to communicate to different group of um, let's call them stakeholders in industry. So in some organizations, in some government um, offices, uh, they are seeking for ways of improving well-being, while other ones are talking about ethics. So sometimes you have to adapt your um, communication to do to those two channels. But I completely agree. Um, they are very, very similar. They do have different bodies of literature. So they are journals called technology and ethics, while there is other ones that are about well-being or mental health. So uh, yeah, there are two different scholarly communities, but I do agree that the two could easily be brought together. Thank you. There was a follow-up comments on that um, in the chat. It was a comment and a question at the same time related to that. And the comment was, well, you could do something ethically good, but people might not be happy about it. So is there any tension between ethic or ethical value, which is like a distinction between good and bad and well-being? Uh... Well, there are tensions. Uh, I think with COVID, we, we are seeing some of these tensions, but it also depends on how you define well-being. That's one of the challenges, and that's why in one of the slides I, I described the different definitions of well-being. Uh, and I think in the, in the first section of questions, the, the problem of using these measures was brought up. So if you look at the virus um, issue, um, there is a conflict in many, in most countries, I will say, between those who want the lockdown to be lifted because the impact on economic, the economic impact is so big um, that people are unemployed, uh, people are not finding substance, there is mental illness, um, increased mental illness. There is, well, a, a huge number of consequences negative consequences. Um, and on the other hand, you have a group of people that are defining well-being mostly as health, meaning reducing the number of people who get ill and who die from the illness. So yes, one of the challenges is which, how do you manage these tensions? And we do that constantly. You know? uh, we, in society, we, we make decisions about increasing productivity because we want to improve the economic aspect uh, and we reduce uh, health. No? So sometimes you have to make a trade-off and these are political trade-offs that people make between uh, industry and the environment, for example, or industry and health, industry and fairness. Um, and I think each society will have to find its own way out of it. And that's why consultation and democracy, in my view, are so important, because it's, it's the only way to understand how um, the impact on human experience of the decisions we make. Thank you. You know, as you see, uh, these are not trivial questions. So these are really very relevant questions. So there's another question from Daniel, and he says, "If we feed an AI mechanism with our and he said moral ideals, that mechanism can possibly turn against us, as we rarely ever live up to our ideals." So we end up on the wrong side of the equation. True or false? How would we deal with that? Uh, let me make a comment before I give you the floor. 
the second uh, lecture that we had from uh, Emmanuel Goffi, Emmanuel make a, a brief introduction to ethics and also explain the differences between ethical and moral. So, um, so that to give a concept. So is that, is that a concern that you also have? Is the engineering uh, discipline embedded moral values into code? Yes. I I believe that the idea that technology is value neutral is a fallacy. It's a mistake that very often engineers make, uh, computer scientists as well, the engineers, designers. Um, technology is not neutral. And, and philosopher has discussed this for millennia. Now, Plato in the Republic already talked about the impact that technology had on social structures. Uh, in particular, in his case, he looked at ships and said the technology, that is a ship, requires certain political structures, uh, a captain and a bunch of people that follow rules. Technologies impose values because it imposes certain uh, ways of organizing power and relationships and so on. Uh, when engineers forget about these, um, many negative consequences arise. Of course, in some technologies, those things are very obvious, and in other cases, it's not. Uh, if you are making a table, designing a new table or a new chair, uh, those power structures might be less clear. Um, although, of course, even there, there will be decisions because you are going to make decisions about materials. And there, when you make decisions about materials, do you use recycle or not? You make decisions about procurement. Are you going to manufacture that table in a place where there is uh, slavery or in a place that doesn't respect human rights? Um, and engineers are involved in, in all those stages from design to production. So obviously engineering or products have the values of the engineers that are involved in the project. I think the, the question also brought something else about AI or systems that have a, a morals through AI. That I'm, I mean, a bit less conf, uh, clear uh, uh, the benefits of of such systems. Again, I don't believe that we can automate ethics or morality, uh, or that we should even try. And even trying, I think, reflects the values of those who are trying. Um, I don't know. Asking Siri. For example, is it right to lie? Um, I haven't tried, actually, I should. Uh, I don't know what Siri will respond. Probably I don't understand. Uh, but I, I don't think that those compu that computers should be our source of ethical values because those technologies are driven by the interests of a very particular group of individuals and organizations. So relying on them as a source of value could be very dangerous. Thank you, Rafael. I would say, well, we're almost uh, at the end of our time. I would like to thank you for the extremely interesting lecture, um, not only me, but uh, people say bring the lecture and so you'll see you see people are really happy about that and thank you for bringing that dimension and and viewpoint in the discussion that we really much appreciate it and to everybody that was uh, attending thank you very much for staying until now asking questions and listening make sure to stay safe uh, because that's really 
one of the most important things at the moment. And Rafael, uh, thank you for spending time with us and uh, sharing this very interesting question. We will have a copy of your presentation soon online and also the recording will be soon online. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank and, you. Uh, have a great day. Thank you for inviting Roberto. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.